requires a victorious Senate candidate to get 50 percent. Kenley, explain this to us. Well, uh, Chris, you have to get 50 percent of the votes cast and uh, 50 percent plus one, and uh, Mary Landrieu was unable to do that. There were a lot of factors that went into this. Uh, the weather was one, but there were eight. She had eight opponents. Uh, five of them were relatively unknown and did not really campaign. Three major Republican candidates, and uh, one of the Republican candidates, uh, the uh, election commissioner here, Susan Terrell, was the one who came out on top. So under this law, he here in Louisiana, actually, there could be two Republicans who uh, wound up. Whoever gets uh, the most votes, the two people who get the most votes, providing one of them doesn't get 51 percent, those are the people who are in the runoff. And that's what's going to happen here on December 7th. Is there a likely coalition partner for Mary Landrieu? In other words, one of the candidates to immediately endorse her and give her the 50-some percent in total votes? That, I'm sorry, I cannot tell you. I'm not that familiar with this, uh, it, it, whether or not that will happen or not. She has, um, uh, some circles here are concerned that she did lost some of the uh, African-American vote because she has supported the president so strongly. She has about a 74 percent uh, voting record with the president. Uh, she's been strong on Iraq and also uh, cutting taxes. So there's some question about how much uh, support she might get from African Americans in this runoff. Well, that support may come back after they've spanked her, apparently. Well, we have more with, uh, thanks for Kenley Jones' report. Thank you, sir, for giving us that report from Louisiana. Let's go right now to United States Senator Wayne Howard, who's out in Colorado in a very tight race out there. Senator Howard, how does that race look to you right now at one o'clock Eastern time? Well, uh, Chris, it's good to be talking to you again. Uh, the AP in Colorado, as well as Channel 9 News, have both declared me a victor, and uh, so that's good news for our side. You can hear a lot of celebration in the background. That's what that's all about. What did you do to turn the corner in the last couple of days? Those polls were very uh, dangerous looking for you. Well, those polls were very irregular. Our internal polls are very steady, uh, holding us persistently at a five to six point lead. And uh, I put a lot of confidence on my internal pollsters, and I think that they proved that they were worth every cent that we were paying them as we moved through this campaign, because they have called this campaign right on the right, right as to where we would end up, and, and they did a great job. How many percentage points would you, uh, would you allot to the president in terms of your victory? He seems to have added to victories uh, for Republicans uh, beginning across the East Coast in Ma Massachusetts governor, Maryland governor, Vermont governor, uh, the, the uh, races for uh, the United States Senate in both Carolinas and in Georgia. In every case, there seems to be a Bush premium in the vote. Do you think you benefited from that? Well, I benefited from the president when he came and visited for Colorado. Uh, the people in Colorado like the president. I think he likes Colorado. And, uh, you know, I look forward to working with him. I think he's worked harder than any other president that I can think of in recent history who really got out and fought to maintain his majority in both the House and the Senate races. You know, back in a number of years ago, Colorado seemed to move to the political left. You had Gary Hart, you had Tim Wirth. It seemed like the state liked the habit of electing uh, Democrats to the United States Senate. Is, has it shifted back because a lot of Californians have moved to Colorado because they thought California was too left and too hippie and too culturally repugnant for them? Yeah, we've had a lot of people move into the state of Colorado since the last time I ran for the United States Senate, about 600,000. Most of them have been Republicans, and so our Republican registration has gone up here in the state of Colorado. Uh, I think one of the big factors to my winning here is that the Republican Party in the past has not worked that hard or been that effective the weekend before election date, and actually the Democrats really outdid them in turning out the vote. This time we had a 96-hour turnout program, and it, it worked beautifully, and it really has helped uh, the Republican candidates all up and down the ballot in this election. There's a news report. Last question. There's a news report out tonight that uh, former United States Senator from Colorado, Gary Hart, is thinking about running for the presidency of the United States in 2004. What do you make of that? His prospects in your home state? Well, I don't. I, I don't think the Republicans are going to have to worry about that. I think the Democrat Party will take care of him becoming before he becomes a, a candidate for president. Okay, you're so cruel. Thank you, Senator Wayne Howard of Colorado. Congratulations on your apparent success tonight. Let's go now to Lester Holt, who's got more numbers. Lester.
Chris, uh, for those who missed it in the Senate race in Texas, uh, NBC News projecting that John Cornyn, the Republican, wins that seat. It's the one that Phil Graham, uh, uh, who re retired, left open. Again, John Cornyn, the projected winner, the Republican, in the Senate Texas race. I want to quickly put up the balance of power that we've been tracking throughout the evening. If you're just joining us here, red Republicans, blue Democrats, we've been filling it in. Remember, only a third of the seats were actually up tonight. Let me show you what's going to keep us up tonight. Here's what you're glued to your TV screen right now. Those three seats in the Democratic side of the aisle. The reason we put them gold is because in the weeks leading up to today, those those races seem too tight in the polling to really uh, to declare someone it leaning one way or the other. In other words, it's toss-up states right now. At 49-46, Republicans leading with 49 apparent seats. Those three seats are key. The Republicans only need one of those to get 50 with the vice president. They've got the keys to the bus in the U.S. Senate. So that's what's keeping you up late tonight. Now, I want to show you very quickly what's going on in Louisiana. Uh, we've talked about this one uh, in, in Louisiana, where the winner has to have at least 50 percent of the vote. Mary Landrieu with 46 percent, 98 percent of the precincts in. NBC News saying that this one appears it'll end up in a runoff December 7th, appears at this hour. Let me show you the Missouri race. I showed you those three gold uh, 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 seats. Here's one of them, Missouri, 95 percent of the precincts reporting Jim Talent hanging out of the slimmest of leads right now over incumbent Democrat Gene Carnahan. Look at that number in the upper right screen, though. 95% of the precincts are getting down near the end here. Jim Talent slightly ahead. Again, those are raw numbers. Another one of those gold seats I showed you, Minnesota. Norm Coleman, the Republican, with 178,387 votes. Walter Mondale, the Democrat, 153,000 votes. Only 30% of the precincts in here. This is the race where they're counting by hand. Had to change those ballots at the last minute to accommodate Walter Mondale. And another one of those gold seats, the state of South Dakota. Look at this one. John Thune, Republican, Democrat Tim Johnson. About 1,000 votes separate these two men, 76% of the precincts reporting in South Dakota. This one goes down to the wire. In the governor's races, Idaho, NBC News projecting that, projecting, boy, it's a late night, that incumbent Republican Governor Dirk Kempthorn will win over Jerry Brady, the Democrat. The Kansas governor race, NBC News projecting, pro projecting the Democrat Kathleen Sibelius will win the open seat, the Democrat in Kansas. And in Oklahoma, an interesting race here. Take a look at this. Well, we're looking at Colorado instead. Colorado, Wayne Allard. But I want to talk about Oklahoma, where it's too close to call between Republican Steve Large and Democrat Brad Henry. I've got to look at my cheat sheet here. There it is, 100%. This is what I wanted to show you. 100% of the precincts in. Look at that. It's about 7,000 votes, both at 43%. NBC News is not making a call in this race. You see the numbers, how close it is, and no call to be made in that race. So, Chris, that's where it stands right now. Those are the latest numbers in the governor and Senate races. Well, sure, that's a lot of information. Let's go right now to one of those three races we're looking at with the, who will decide who controls the United States Senate. Jim Ablis in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Jim, any, can you interpret those numbers? They look awful close out there. And in fact, if you look at the hard numbers that we're seeing right now, these are hard numbers from the Secretary of State. For the first time tonight, John Thune has taken the lead with about 80% of the votes counted in the state. He has about a 3,000 vote lead. He's been behind all night long. Now, the way things work here in South Dakota is, in the western part of the state, they're an hour behind because it's mountain time west of the river in the middle of the state. So those votes are counted last. Uh, in the west, it's mostly rural. And most of those votes usually go to the Republicans. That's why the lead, is, the lead by Johnson has been shrinking and now has evaporated. Now, does that mean that this is lost? Not necessarily. Here's why. There are Indian reservations in the West as well. We don't know if those votes have been counted yet, that those are Democratic strongholds. So there is still a chance that Tim Johnson would, would uh, escape with a win here tonight. But 
it is trending right now toward the Republican Jim Thune, the course that he is, President Bush's hand-picked candidate, and would go right along with what's been happening in the rest of the evening here in South Dakota, a complete sweep here in South Dakota tonight for the Republicans. The only race still in jeopardy here is this Senate race still in question, and right now the Republican, for the first time tonight, has the lead. Chris. Jim Abla, hold on there. Howard Feynman of Newsweek, an MSNBC analyst, wants to ask you a question. Just a quick question. I know that the Democrats were, were hoping that the drought situation and the problems of the ranchers and farmers West River would give them some, uh, some added strength in the West, but you're saying that it's not working out that way. Well, all, what happened is on Sunday and then during the week, uh, previous, President Bush came into, into South Dakota and, uh, and granted some drought relief go, here in the West as well. well and that, uh, and that go, certainly addressed some of those issues. Okay, thanks a lot, Jim Avila, who's in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Again, those three races are going to be decisive. What I find interesting is Thune's ahead by 3,000 votes with, with a quarter of the vote yet to be counted in the western part of the state. But you're right about the drought and the Indian thing. I heard from Ken Bode, the long, long-time NBC correspondent, that they're putting a lot of money into that effort Who's to try to win Dakota the Indian vote. By the what? Who's a South Dakota native, by the There you have it. Anyway, more with expertise like this man who knows where everybody's <laughs> from, Howard Feynman. More with election 2002 hardball style. When we come back, it's 1.30 in the morning and we're still working. There's a case yeah. that can be made here, and I want you to make it. Well, first the of all, the president went into some cases where yeah. the people were not the front runners, right. and That's trying to correct. help people like Carl McCall, for example, who was not the front runner Absolutely. in New York State. Absolutely, and Jimmy, Lou, Jimmy Lou Fisher was they not the front runner. When, he, when Bill Clinton, well, Bill McBride was not the front boom, runner, and, and, and also, I mean, Hello, look, I'm George the, the, w. Bush. the other thing is oh. that. Look, what George W. Bush you? not only used enormous political capital to help these Republican candidates, he also raised a record sum of money. And uh, let me tell you, money works. Money rules in campaigns. Let me campaigns. tell you, Bill Clinton knows all about money, and he but knows this, all he about but this, yes, he but, but this president Donna outraged Dorland? the former president for the one. You got it hands down. This well, president there's only is, a, is, I is have very, means very good. Something. I want to tell it you something, something as you, as you, as you debase Bill Clinton's uh, uh, record in his, in his name. I know the Democrats enough to know that they don't judge their people by how many elections they win. They judge them whether they stood with them when times Absolutely. were tough. Bill Clinton has built himself up as, in effect, the leader of the Democratic Party nationally. I yes. think so. Yeah. What, 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 hap what happened, Chris? What happened in a lot of these cases was it was like the old sign, you know, in case of fire, break glass. You know, right. go after the emergency. Clinton was the emergency lever they were pulling. A lot of these Democrats didn't want to have him in there in a very visible oh, role, yes. but they were so far behind that they needed. Guys, him. Speaking Bush of money, goes into Minnesota, and the guy right. who's supposed to okay. lose may well win. Clinton goes into Maryland where the girl is supposed to win does not. What can I been, tell you? Can I say one thing about race money? In California would have been cheaper today so apparently just to buy the voters than to spend what they spent on television looking at this. <laughs> well, I want to go back to my argument. I wish somebody would join this, at least positively or negatively, that we're watching the emerging battle between two dynasties, political dynasties to be perhaps. This I was watching Tom Brokaw interview uh, Jeb Bush today. I was thinking he might be interviewing the greatest generation of the Bushes because well, he got the two yeah. brothers there to use his phrase from his book. But also, I think the Clintons are as hungry politically as they were 30 years ago. You bet your they life. want it. They're hungry. You and they're going to fight for the presidency you harder than any other Democrats. Life. And I'll put money on the table right now. When anyone says she's going to be a candidate one way or the other, for 2004. 2004, drafted, runs herself. Believe well, me, Donna wants over. her to run in 2004. Well, she's going to run in 2004. Great, I'm telling you, they can't chance. wait to 2008. The, the hunger's out there. They're going to go. Gosh, I'll put but Peggy's the vow Peg, that Peg, she wouldn't do it. Yeah, but I don't care what she said. Peggy's point is a good no, one. Which no, no, not Hillary. Yeah. Right now, the Bush dynasty is in the ascendancy, right. big time. Yeah. Bill Clinton may be a good backroom operator, uh -huh. but he's not a good out front salesman. Yeah. And when Hillary You're starts, great. when Hillary starts, I wrote about Hillary right. recently traveling the country. She's got it in her eyes, okay. but she might not have. This it would be the perfect eyes. division of labor. Hillary Clinton gets to be president of the United States. He, she has all the, the flip room. charts, all the staff does all Absolutely. the work, which she loves to do. Bill Clinton's upstairs. He's got the Lincoln bedroom. He's got the refrigerator. Oh, oh, he's God. got everything for him. He's got the cigar box. He's got everything going for him. <laughs> and she's got his poison. perfect job description. Anyway, we'll be back with about what a crazy guy I have to talk about that. Anyway, I do think the Clintons are still in this game, and I think it's going to be a battle royal the next couple of elections, especially in 2008. Jeb Bush, Hillary Clinton. That's the fight in six years. You're watching Hardball's coverage of the 2002 election. It's true.
conference call. That comes from Ari Fleischer's conference call, which I was listening to a little while ago. And they're focusing on those three states. The reason George Bush is staying up until 1.30 at 2 o'clock in the morning is because he's as curious as everybody else about Missouri, South Dakota, and Minnesota. And those are the states where he picked the candidates, the three amigos, yeah. Jim Talent, John Thune, and Norm Coleman, his hand-picked he candidates, and he's been and cultivating those thing. candidacies. And he made repeated visits to all those states, I mean, up to the very last minute. Those are his babies. Let's go to Lester Holt for more numbers. All right, well, we can't make an official projection, but we can tell you NBC News believes that it appears that the uh, Republicans will at least maintain control in the U.S. House of Representatives. Let's look at some of the Senate races that keep us glued to the TV screens and glued to all these charts. The Minnesota race, NBC News determining too close to call. That's, of course, Walter Mondale, the Democrat, versus Norm Coleman, the Republican. There you see the raw numbers, and yes, they are coming in slowly. That, of course, because they're hand-counted ballots, paper ballots. 36% of the precincts in Coleman maintaining what next? About a, uh, let's see, 213 to 192 uh, right now. 51 to 46% lead over Walter Mondale. Let's look at South Dakota right now. This has been another uh, race that we knew that would keep us here late. It's lived up to its billing. John Thune, the Republican, with 139,000 votes. Tim Johnson right behind, 136. The Democrat, 80% of the precincts in South Dakota right now. The Missouri Senate race, they're up to 96% in, and Jim Talent maintains his lead over Democratic incumbent Gene Carnahan, 909,000 votes to 881,000 votes. Again, you're looking at raw numbers here. Let's take a look at some governor's races now, shall we? This is uh, in the state of Georgia, where the projected winner is Sonny Perdue, the, with 51% of the vote right now, 93% of the votes uh, uh, of the precincts reporting. The expected winner now is what we're reporting in the state of Massachusetts would be Mitt Romney, the uh, former chief of the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake, with a little over a million votes. Shannon O'Brien, the state treasurer, 960,000 votes. Again, NBC saying that Mitt Romney, the expected winner in the state of Massachusetts for governor. Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano. 46%. The Democrat, Matt Salmon, 45%, 88% of the precincts. I probably could have pronounced that better if it was three hours earlier. To California right now, and this is the race uh, that, Chris, you've been concentrating a good deal of the evening on. It's closer than many expected. Now, it's 45% of the precincts in. Gray Davis, the incumbent Democrat right now, with about 47% of the vote. Bill Simon, Republican. 43 percent, but again, a lot closer than many people suspected it might be in California. We'll keep an eye on it. The governor's race in Maine, 83 percent of the precincts in. John Baldacci with 48 percent. He's the Democrat uh, leading his uh, Republican uh, opponent, 41 percent. Let's move to the state of Minnesota right now. 48% of the precincts reporting here. Tim Pawlenty with 45% of the vote leading his uh, opponent, Roger Moe, on the Democratic side. We move to the state of Oregon right now. 56% of the vote in here. Kevin Mannix, the Republican, with a narrow lead over his Democratic challenger. In Vermont, the governor's... I'm sorry, tell me again, Steve. In which race? Okay, Vermont, we can tell you that NBC will not be projecting a winner. This is Jim Douglas, Doug Racine. Uh, Jim Douglas, Republican, 45%. Doug Racine, 42%. NBC News will not be naming a winner in that one tonight, or projecting a winner, I should say. Let's look at the Wisconsin governor's race. They've got 92% in there. Right now, Democrat Jim Doyle leads Scott McCallum, 45% to 42%. The Wyoming governor's race, 88% in. Dave Frundenthal, 52%. He's the uh, Democrat over Eli Bebout, 46% of the Republican side. And that's what we're looking at right now, Chris. Those are the latest of the governor's races. Okay, Lester, thanks for doing that. You know, it's interesting that the White House has put out a statement, and you very, uh, very kindly allowed the president's unusually un <laughs> uh, up late tonight. He is notorious well, he for likes getting to bed sleep. with a book, and then Laura around 9.30 at night with the rest of us deep thinkers have to imagine the future of the republic. <laughs> but it is interesting. He's up now. He's Listen, hoping to get this big one tonight. Uh, we, one of the he wants the trifecta. One right? of the themes of the night has been, once again, the underestimation of George Bush and his pulling power and his attention to de detail. He and Rowe, 
scoped out every last detail of this. And don't think that Bush isn't interested in the details. He loves the details of politics, and he loves to sit and game plan with Rove. He doesn't want to go to bed not knowing what the results in the well, Senate are going to be. But the fact is that we have a situation now where the Republicans are ahead, in all, uh, narrowly though, in all three of those Senate races, which again makes the odds even higher that they're probably Peggy, going to have you figured out this guy yet? Because I haven't figured him out yet. Sometimes I look at the guy and I say, George W. Bush, regular guy. Al Gore was too sort of pseudo intellectual. He pretended he was smarter than he was. This guy plays, plays stupider than he is, and that works in American politics. Suttler, they always said that uh, Al Gore talked to us like English was our, our second, second language. Second and, and, and this guy talked to us like English was his second language. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it didn't hurt him. Have you figured this guy out yet? I don't know if I figured him out. I think, look, if you're going back to 2000, Al Gore seemed like a fellow who was simply too strange, one or two steps <laughs> beyond as strange as you want your president to be. You're sitting George next Bush, to his campaign manager. Yeah, I understand that. George Bush strikes me, and I think has struck me for some time, as a fellow who represents almost the triumph of the normal. He is a bright guy. He speaks the language of America. What is that, the masculine language of America? It's sports and business. He doesn't get high philosophy. Luton. He is not an intellectual. He doesn't try to be an intellectual. He thinks it's fine that they exist, but that's not where he is. He goes with his gut. He goes with common sense. He is a guy who I think is really fairly easy to read, and he's smart. And I think he loves it that people think he's stupid. I don't happen to think Americans are stupid. <coughs> not at all. But I think but, people on TV panels to, tend to think he's me, stupid. Me some, but some, Americans don't. He's well, a smart guy. Let, let say, I think he I, proved I it tonight. He was stupid. I never thought he was stupid, and I never thought that the campaign that they ran in 2000 was a stupid campaign. They're very good at organizing. Carl Rove is a very strategic thinker. He understands the numbers. And I, I believe going into 2002 that we had a real, the Democratic Party had a real <laughs> challenge of trying to define ourselves early on before the Republicans define us. The Republicans define us, and I think that's what we're seeing tonight. But a Maybe magic the people defined you. But, but Peggy, there's also a magic <laughs> moment. The people before 9 11 did not think this of him in the country. They had a lot more questions. Something happened that transformed the country on 9 11. Of course. It transformed him with the country. It's speeding Something up the happened process. before that, Pat. Really the debates did. with Al Gore no, 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 worked to his favor. People course, liked yes. it close I'm up. I'm not yeah. disagreeing with that. I love yeah. my theory, but I'm telling you something. 9 11 speeded up something, the process. Something fundamental and something in the presidency that mysticism took place after 9 11, and it's very powerful. You know, it was a powerful bomb. Peggy probably won't believe this, but I've <laughs> never underestimated George W. Bush except for one time. That was in 1994 when I wrote parallel profiles of George W. Bush and Jeb Bush. And I, like a lot of other people, watched Jeb, the mellifluous one, the easy-mannered one, the one that the family seemed to favor. And I thought he was the Bush of the future and not the guy who seemed to be out of his league and out of his element in politics. When George Bush is not on stage and not before the cameras, he is articulate and as forceful with the use of the language as anybody I know. It's when he's worried about being criticized for not being able to be you know, the performer that he clams Isn't up. Is that when words like strategery come yeah. up? Yeah, but after what happened was on 9-11, that whatever capacities he had, which are considerable, they bloomed after 9-11, and that's what, for now, the American people are responding Can to. Can I ask you a profound question, because it is an election night, not a bad time to ask it. I agree with everything everybody said. And I think a sort of a lack of sophistication to a certain point is attractive. We like a guy who's basic, simple, Gary Cooper, do the right thing, yep, nope, ma'am, here it is. But when we're dealing with a very complicated world, like the Arab and Islamic world right now, we have all kinds of cultures in that part of the world, potentially are actively hostile to us. And we're trying to find our way to some sort of way of living with them, a modus vivendi with the Arab world. That's all we're hoping for. Is this the guy to do it, Margaret Noonan? You better go with your gut in those circumstances, and you'd better, you have a good gut, but you also had better, <laughs> look, uh, this is my take on the presidency. It comes down to who you are as a human being. What you bring to the table as a president is your character and who you are and your gut and your well-meaningness and your intelligence. You can hire people who are specialists on the Mideast. You can hire a lot yeah, of Yeah, but things, they all disagree. But you better, look, Chris. you better have a... They can find
fight it out, but ultimately he's going to have to make the decision. I know a lot of people. Look, David Frum has a book that's coming out. David Frum worked okay, just I, for him as a speechwriter for a year. I Very dread the thought of what David man. Frum, the guy who came out with the axis of evil and gave the president a list of countries to hate. Yeah. David that's a little Frum, scary. a very intelligent Chris, 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 man, has written a book called <laughs> The Right Man that says essentially God. Bush is well, the right guy for the moment. Tonight. I'm just having fun Spare talking and cutting guys. others off. I, I am afraid that this president, who everybody's delighted in his lack of sophistication, is surrounded by people like David Frum, is, who are very sophisticated and are possibly my, my moving point, this guy in dangerous directions. I have been preaching on this show for a long time that George Bush is more methodical and careful than you give him credit for. Remember in the heat of the moment about how we were going to bomb Iraq instantly, I said yeah. he's going to jump through more diplomatic and political hoops than you think. And he has and he will. Another essential aspect of Bush's character is he's cautious and he's methodical. Don't mistake the West Texas bluster for what the end game is. Now you can argue that that method of diplomacy you know, breaks a lot of crockery around the world, and that's a good point. But he is going to get more support than you think and move more cautiously than you think, and he's not an unsophisticated person. I, I don't agree with that analysis. This is a guy who hides in plain sight who likes to be underestimated, who likes to be seen as a clown sometimes, as he was on the, on the campaign plane. He mastered the campaign plane in 2000 by being the fraternity president. But that's not all he is, or even essentially who he is. He's much, and he is using the divisions in his administration for his own advantage to buy time until he figures out what to do, if anything, in Iraq. You don't yeah, believe he's riding the tiger, analysis. do you? I'm afraid he's riding the tiger with all these hawks around him, and I'm afraid he can't stop them, and that's what scares well, me. I We're going to come right back with more coverage, Hardball's coverage of the election 2002. What's happening? It looks like George W. Bush has pulled another triumph. By the way, a clean one this time. No dispute. His candidates are winning. His opponents are losing. Big Bush night around the country. More coming up as we decide who's probably going to control the United Senate in about an hour from now. Back with final results in an hour. In a moment. For you. Thank you. I have, I have just called Mr. Talent and conceded this race. I want to, I want I want to congratulate him for his effective and his victorious campaign. But I also want to thank my staff for it. Let will all of them raise their hands that are in here. here. Thank you. There is none more devoted than they. None who were more valiant foot soldiers in the battle. None more deserving of praise than they. And I also want to thank the working men and women who have united so forcefully in this common cause. You, you, fought, you fought courageously against overwhelming odds, and you gave yourself tirelessly to an effort in which you firmly believed. We are all the better for the battle. We proclaimed our hopes and our visions for the future, and we did it with energy, born of compassion and conviction. Ours is a cause that has not been lessened by defeat or diminished by the heartache we feel this night. As always, others will come to lift the fallen torch. The fire will not go out. No. This evening, let me thank you for the deep honor of allowing me to serve the two years of my husband's term. It was truly a momentous time in our nation's history, and it is my hope that those who write of such things in years to come will say, Missouri's first woman to serve in the United States Senate from Missouri. Missouri's first woman to serve in, as the U.S. Senator, though she did not serve us long, she served us well. Thank you. 
Well, that was a wonderful concession speak, very gracious, by Jean Carnahan, who two years ago lost her husband in a plane crash. It must have been very deeply reminded of that when Paul's Wellstone was killed in a plane crash just a couple of days ago. And I have to say, you are the pro here. I want to talk to you about this. It has nothing to do with politics. The hardest thing in politics, Donna, is to concede Absolutely. your state senate and, and, and assembly district races for 35 million people five of them are competitive is not right. a real democracy having right. a congress where we have 10 races that are competitive and everything else is not competitive is not what democracy is supposed right. to be Except and we ought to understand that because let me say you don't have to vote pat you only vote when you have a beef and apparently a lot of people no, in this country don't, don't have, have a right. beef well, That's excuse why they me. Don't bother excuse me. No, no, Chris, let's right. back up. No, no. When in fact it's cut up in the back room, so you don't have a beef. How do you register that? And let me just say this: on your point about 9/11, the Republican the primary people, in California, they voted for uh, and Bill the Democrat. Excuse Ridge. me, and the Democratic governor spent ten million dollars in what was supposed to be a closed primary after we had voted twice for an open primary in california and they both parties went to the supreme court and said oh no the right of association so we have a closed primary and what happens democratic candidate spends ten million dollars he's not on the ballot right. attacking one of the people that is not democracy and nobody okay. in the press says let me a word. go back to something positive about executive ability i think the country wants leaders i think that's why george w. bush enjoys support why rumsfeld is popular why cheney's popular i don't particularly like their policies well, but they they are executives Chris, and people like that. I think that. another thing you're saying is that people sort of want administration, <laughs> not emotion. Right. Yeah, that this is not about who can yell the loudest. It's or not, give them a nice poetic yeah, speech. Or just poetic speech or who can right. really jazz up the crowd. It's about who can, can get things done in a low-key kind of way. I think that's part of the <clears throat> message here. And that's why women candidates such as Sibelius in Kansas, mm. in Granholm in Michigan, one, not because they're tapping into emotion, but because they've proven they're proven administrators. And Ed Rendell in Pennsylvania proved himself to be a very good mayor of Philadelphia, which was why even people in Pittsburgh were willing to vote for him. Right. I agree Big that message. it is also an election about issues and about stands. Yes. The uh, the um, sh the young lady who lost so badly to Mitt Romney in Massachusetts was someone who looked like a tax hike waiting to happen. <laughs> All right. In Massachusetts. Uh, believe me, in Massachusetts. And you know what? They've had enough taxes there. Uh, certainly the economy was an issue. Taxes, the size of government spending. It seems to me a certain there's a certain moderation that has come in and solidified in these areas that well, we can see Peggy, what, in this election. But what the Republicans are going to have to do, having triangulated on prescription drugs and Medicare and so on, Absolutely. having blunted that in this campaign, yeah. now with control of Congress, they're actually going to have to pass something. If they right. don't, that'll then give the, the Democrats an opening. Find some issues. They're going to have to actually go out and stand for some things this party used to it's stand not, for. It's not just issues. Whether it's, it's on the vision. environment, it's a vision. It's a, the Democrats no, it's, vision. Have it's a also vision. the integrity of a vision. It's to believe that stand up if you're going to lose over the fact that you're, the people are being ripped off in their 411. Make that a case. Well, what do we want to take the country, and especially going into a presidential season in, in about 24 hours? I think the party is going to have to I'm explain to, to the American politics. people what they want to take the country and what's the alternative. Let's talk about some people who sat out this election, not just election night, but basically we're off the screen. I know Al Gore campaigned for a bunch of people. I didn't see him around tonight anywhere. He didn't seem to be a big face on television anywhere. The other thing is, whatever happened to John Kerry, who I really like as a candidate, who was going to be the big anti-war voice of the Democratic Party, he votes for the president three weeks ago and has subsequently apparently disappeared in his re-election campaign. It seems like everybody likes cute John Edwards from North Carolina. <laughs> for the life of me, I can't figure out what he stands for, That's except true. for Hillary Clinton who has gone from being perceived to be a very liberal woman to being a bit more moderate in her attitude. Uh, I don't see any leadership in that Democratic Party. What do you see, Donna? Who are your stars coming well, out of tonight? Well, uh, clearly uh, many of our gubernatorial candidates will now have another platform in which to raise their issues and begin to articulate for the party a vision for the 21st century. But the name, two, level. name two superstars coming out tonight. Make, uh, us, make the Democrats feel good uh, watching uh, right now. Jennifer Granholm, Ed Rendell, clearly Kathleen Sebelius, who can prove, uh, prove okay. that she can win in a Republican state. Don't Kansas. forget Blagojevich. Blagojevich, I'll tell you, that guy's barely won. One interesting he is a hot ticket, but he only won by four. Interesting thing in these states, what I call the Big Ten states, right. you know, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, where the Democrats had takeaways. Right. They won, but as the night went on, the percentages shrank so that while those Democrats did take those seats, they didn't take them by the margins that looked like they were going to take them earlier in the day. But that's the only really good news for the Democrats tonight, except that it's in their old strongholds of the Rust Belt. 
Uh, and those are the sort of the states that in the high tide of Republicanism under Bush, those are the only states where they had any good news tonight in the Midwest. And the funny thing is the Republicans always controlled those Rust Belt governorships all the years they lost the presidency. Well, under Ronald so it may Reagan. So maybe a flip side yeah. of controlling the exactly. White House. You get exactly. that as the competition They rose. Price. They rose in Michigan in those states during the Clinton years. Now the reverse is happening. Can I say, I think this was a bad night for Al Gore. <coughs> he was out there. He did Florida pretty hard. He was out there campaigning. It only two years ago, Al Gore won the popular vote in the United States of America by half a million votes. He's run around understandably complaining about how he was cheated by history. I think after the gains of the Republican Party tonight and the losses of the Democrats, he's going to have to lose that refrain. It ain't going to go anywhere now. And okay. he looks like a guy who didn't make anything solid. But, okay, happen. we'll be back with everybody after this break. By the way, our next segment is going to be our last segment of the night. Everyone's final thoughts about, by the way, let's make it positive. Let's talk about who blew it. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about who deserved to have uh, the knives out for him. Who's going to die after this election? Okay. Let's talk about the big losers in this election night. Coming to win the House, keep the House rather, win the Senate and help his brother get reelected. He has won the big three tonight. The Democratic Party has lost control of the United States Senate because of the loss in, in Missouri we just announced. And they have lost any chance of winning the House of Representatives tonight. And they have lost any chance of fulfilling Terry McAuliffe's dream of destroying the Bush dynasty in Florida, which means the Republicans have won all three contests which were at stake tonight. I want to thank the man who tonight has presented us with, I think, at the last count, 125,000 numbers. That's Lester Holt, who's been behind me over there. There he is, sir. It was actually 126,000, but who's counting at this the point? The panel salutes you, sir. And Thanks, uh, it's been great working with you, even though I'm across the room from you. I want to thank Nora O'Donnell, who I think may have taken a powder by now. She was great with all the uh, information about what people were trying to say with their votes. Uh, we're going to have a, a graveyard shift come in here. I'm sorry, Rick Sanchez. I couldn't call. I shouldn't call him that. He's going to be coming in and relieving us around three o'clock this morning and going right through the day with some of these races. For example, what we're going to get to a, a bit more ourselves tonight in South Dakota and also in uh, in Minnesota. But those races don't show signs of closing in the next couple of minutes. We're also going to go to California in a moment. I have to say. Uh, that, Pat, you've been so tough on our democratic system, and maybe I just well, wanted to know I want to defend something. Everybody we saw tonight at those headquarters, at yeah. both parties, the winners and losers, the people crying and the people smiling. And I spent this weekend with Ed Rendell, one of the great candidates this time. The people that get out, the labor guys, the labor women that get out, the people with not much money to come out and work in campaigns, they're the heroes of this country. They keep our democracy they, uh, going. And you don't, you don't dump on people who are listening tonight. People, by the way, watching now are all interested in politics. And they all voted. Why would anybody watch tonight who isn't voting? So I want to talk to the people right now who voted today, who worked in campaigns. You guys make democracy work in this country. And Donna knows all about this. Absolutely. And Pat knows all about this. We shouldn't demi uh, in any way deride our democracy to the people who are watching right now. Because they're the ones who participate. It's Absolutely. the ones that are bored with it all, who think they've got better things to do. We're not helping our democracy because maybe they're too fat and happy, or maybe they've given up on our system. But we shouldn't judge except to say that the people who are the heroes of any ongoing Chris, democracy spent, are the people who work in these I've campaigns. I've spent my life in this process and belief in this democracracy. So I don't, I don't take second place to anybody in that. But I think not to understand that there are problems, and I admire the people who are holding it together, but to pretend that there are not the severe problems in this democracy, who owns it and who runs it, is a mistake. And it hurts the country not to say it. Okay, let's go to Gray. Let's say something about Gray Davis, the man who I think was named by God Gray Davis. Yes. Uh, one of the most boring politicians on the planet. Oh. You know who he is, Donna. You know he's just a cash and register. He knows how to raise money on the job. I have no idea what he stands for. Do you? No. For, okay. for winning. For winning. He has he won the election. For he has projected himself. We have projected him here at NBC that he is going to win the election. So, Pat, despite your efforts to try to gin up a close race out Excuse there me. after the fact. Excuse me. I know, that like none, I know that all of, everyone's an expert, but there's still, there will be hundreds of thousands of votes counted in the absentees still because of the way our state works. But the, also the problem is it doesn't matter. The man spent $60 million. He was running against an idiot. And he basically <laughs> is a guy who basically crushed his own party's constituency. No, we're going to have a turnout less than 30% or 30% in that state, and it's going to be a close election. If that's what that bought, that says something good, by the way, about the system, not bad. Okay, so you can't buy California. Donna Brazil, please speak on behalf of your party. Well, first of all, I think the, the party did very well at the state and local level, and that's, that, that's good. That's good news for the party to begin the rebound on, on Wednesday morning. There'll be a lot of discussion, I know, over the next couple of weeks about who will lead the party and who will prepare to run for president in 2004. But 
Overall, I think work and families lost tonight. I mean, Republicans, Peggy, I know you believe dearly in what the Republican Party stands for, but I believe that work and families lost tonight. Peggy. I believe that working families won tonight because they, uh, the, they elected a heck of a lot of people in the Senate and the House who will protect their interests, protect their pocketbook, keep the liberal elite from taking their money and spending it on the things that amuse them. Um, I think there are a heck of a lot of losers in this, but, but the biggest thing is that this is a historic evening for the first time in, we all guess, a century. A sitting president in an off-year election has, we think, picked up the House and the Senate, has covered himself in glory, okay. and has become a major power. Okay, America. let's get to the best part of the evening, the big losers. Gephardt, lost <laughs> seats in the House. Howard, which one? I picked Gephardt well, and Daschle, big losers yeah, tonight. Gephardt and Daschle are two of the big ones. Uh, Dick Morris, the pollster, who said it was a huge mistake for George Bush to go gallivanting around the country because he was climbing down <laughs> off his pedestal. I think Bill Clinton... There's a character witness. Yeah. All right. I, I think that Bill Clinton and Terry McAuliffe have lost here. Right. I agree with Peggy where, you know, Bill Clinton was almost the typhoid Mary of campaigning in this season, as it turns out. And yes, he's a good backroom, Paul, but he has no front stage presence, and that's bad for the party. I think the mood within the Democratic Party is going to be, let's go forward. Let's quit looking backwards with the older candidates, with the past president. Let's think of some new ideas. Let's not just talk about prescription yeah. drugs and Medicare. Let's find some way to appeal to younger voters. Right now, the Republicans have a better chance of appealing to under 30 voters than the Democratic Party as traditionally structured does. The Democratic Party talks about prescription drugs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. They don't speak to new issues. California is always the state that presages what else is happening in the country. If Gray Davis is the future of the Democratic Party, I would submit the Democrats have a big, big problem. And that soul searching is beginning now in the wee hours of the morning in the Democratic Party. Absolutely. They've got to get some passion and they've got to get an identity because they don't have one right now. And they've got to get issues. The age of Clinton ended tonight. The age of Bush truly began tonight. You wish. California revealed itself to be a state, I think, with low turnout, we said more no. interested in the Winona trial right. than in the By gubernatorial the election. I know you have Hillary okay. coming up on the college tour. Right. We're talking about Bill Clinton, not necessarily Hillary Rodham Clinton, okay? Clintonism <laughs> at the moment is over. It may she's start again in two years. She's got to separate herself from that. Yes, she does. She does. Meanwhile, we're still waiting on the results from the last election. You're right, from Winona's election. I the only woman to face a felony charge for shoplifting in the state of California's history waits still as the jury still votes. Well, the the problem, I think the Democrats made a big mistake of looking back to uh, 2000 this election instead of looking forward to 2004. And this effort to, to, wreak, uh, to reap revenge for Florida, the focus uh, on Florida, you. the bitterness towards Florida, the use of it in every rally I've ever seen on television, you've seen them all, we're going to get even for Florida, we're going to get even for Florida. Let's spend yeah. a zillion dollars down to defeat Jeb Bush, and your party went right in the tank well, down there. The past point was, I, I was pointing out that the Florida Democrats wanted that to happen. Yeah. But it had to be McAuliffe, the DNC chair, the whole, who said, no. don't do it. Don't, we're not going to spend That's all right. the money. We did, what we did is we satisfied that urge. And I'll tell you what, at the end of the day, living that battle over and over again is how you end up losing. Remember That's last wars? In the That's in the past. My, it was uh, yesterday. My, yeah, it's over. My but, favorite but, political slogan is, don't get mad, don't get even, get ahead. <laughs> and I think the Democrats should have followed that one. They'd be ahead right now. But I think we're getting very close to the end. Final word, everybody. Howard. Uh, I'm waiting to see how the Democratic Party figures out a way out of the wilderness that they're in, and I'm waiting to see how George Bush uses the, the real assent he's been given right, by the country now. Yeah. This is a huge opportunity, which he sought, and give him credit right. for wanting the opportunity. The world headlines, now he's got to use it. The world headlines are going to be very good for the president. Very good for the president. Yep, I think he is right now. George Bush has become what he did not become on election night 2000. He is a giant bestride the nation. Uh. He <laughs> is a power. But what he does with his power over the next two years is going to be a fascinating thing Donna, to see. the first thing the Democrats have to do is what? Well, first of all, we need to just go back to the basics and get the party back moving uh, ahead again. First of all, I want to just say congratulations to Karl Rove, and then congratulations to all the Democrats who won at the state and local level and all of those congressional races. Patrick Cadell. You know, I just want to say something. When the, when the Republican Party was born in 1856, in its first election, it won control of the Congress, which no one realizes, and, and then it won the presidency okay. four year, six years later. But the fact is, 
that right now the Democratic Party faces okay, the question after being a majority party of whether it's going to survive or be replaced now okay. because there's a vacuum a big, here. A big thank you to Pat and the entire panel, Howard Feynman, Peggy Noonan, Donna Brazil, Pat Cadell, and thank you to Nora O'Donnell, Lester Holt, and all the NBC News correspondents and producers we've been hearing from around the country. And my ad lib is, it's been fun. I love this stuff. The crackle, the icy crackle of victory and defeat. Stay with us on MSNBC for continuing coverage throughout the morning on this election results. My colleague Rick Sanchez is coming up. I'll be back for more hardball, believe it or not. Tomorrow night at 9 Eastern, I'll be back. For now, on behalf of NBC's Hardball's Decision 2002 team, the whole team, good night.